Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Thabo Makwakwa, and today we're hosting the Judge President of the Western Cape, um, Lope, Judge President Lope. Good afternoon, Mr. Nokok. Um, Judge President Lope, it's good to have you here, and I'm really honored to have been given this opportunity to have a chat with you. Thank you very much. It's good to have you, and you're welcome to Summit Again Farm. Beautiful. Okay, so I want us to start with your upbringing, your profile. As a young man growing up in Tutuza, if I'm correct. Guatuguza. Guatuguza. Yes. Okay, so growing up, how was it like for you? I was born in Guatuguza on the 19th of May, 1959. Uh, we were only two uh, sons. I was the youngest. Yes. Uh, uh, we grew up very poor. We lived on a farm. I remember going to school, walking barefooted for about six kilometers every day to school in the morning and walking back from school another six kilometers. Wow. We grew up really in rural areas and life was always challenging. Yeah. Poverty was the order of the day, but we survived and my parents were very poor. My father was a traditional healer part-time, yes. but a security guard full-time. And my mother was a domestic worker. Mm. Uh, and uh, that's basically how we grew up. We were poor. I was lucky, both my brother and I, who's late, we were lucky. Uh, we were sponsored. Someone took, was very keen on us okay. and he sponsored our education until I finished my LLB degree in 1982. 1982. Yes, I was very, very lucky. Yes, I finished From my which second, university? Uh, I finished my LLB in 1982 at the University of Natal in Peter Marisbeck. Oh. That's right. I was very lucky and I used to work for this gentleman. Yes. I was his gardener. Okay. In fact, I worked in the garden until I finished my LLB degree. Uh, yes. <laughs> That's beautiful. It sounds That's like right. a very interesting <laughs> journey. I think, um, like, you know, the second question I would ask after yes. having, you know, um, gotten to hear your side of the story in terms of your background, mm -hmm. how you grew up, it really sounds like, you know, some really challenging journey that you've had. Mm -hmm. And now looking back, you know, at those years and where you are today, we're sitting here right at a farm. Yes. And you come from the farms. In fact, yes. you have got family members who have been working at the farms. That's right. And here you own a beautiful farm. Well, I was very lucky. <laughs> In fact, I would say working hard, growing up, farming. I mean, mm -hmm. at the age, for instance, of 12, I used to carry 20 kilogram fertilizer on my back. Mm. Even today, I'm almost 62. I can run faster than you, yes. right? So yes. I became very strong physically. And I said to myself, one day I will own a piece of land and uh, do and some farming. It happened. I was very lucky. My dream yeah. was fulfilled to that yeah. extent. What's and I some, enjoy farming. Yeah. What, what, what some of the notable challenges that you might have met that in a way might have, you know, sort of distracted you from becoming the person you are today? Well, obviously growing up poor, you don't have everything that you wish you could. Yes. Not just food, but in terms of other uh, things in life, other opportunities. Opportunities become limited, particularly if you live in rural areas. Yes. Undoubtedly, there will always be things that you wish you could have. But yeah. the bottom line Correct. is you must be content Correct. with what God has given you yeah. and work with what you have. Yes. Rather than blaming somebody else, you just have to work with what you have mm. and make sure you, you make a success of it. Beautiful. Right, so what sort of, you know, principles and values that your parents, you know, obviously in your upbringing have sort of instilled in you becoming a man that you are today? I think the first important thing is respect for fellow new humankind. My mother was a Christian, my father was also a Christian. They went to church on a regular basis. I also used to go to church when I was young. Uh, it was respect for humankind, respect for God, respect for fellow men, but most importantly, respect is end right yes. nobody is born to be respected <laughs> it works yeah. both ways of you course. respect people you lead and thereby expecting them to respect you but you don't impose yourself yeah. and the other thing that my parents taught me is to be strong yeah. I know both parents are dead now I can't rush back to my mother's womb mm -hmm. I've got to be strong at all relevant times and not uh, I mustn't look to others for help yeah. or solution 
Yes, no, well, that's beautiful. And I understand also with your um, political credentials that you have played a huge role in, you know, fighting apartheid, you were an activist growing up. Can you tell us a bit about that? Well, when we grew up, certainly, uh, apartheid was the... I was born into an apartheid environment. Grew up in an apartheid environment, there was yes. no equality. Police brutality was the order of the day. And that undoubtedly forced us into, uh, I'm using the word guardedly, forced in inverted commas. Okay. We all got it, certainly I got involved uh, in a number of activities in those days. There was UDF uh, yeah. and many, many other organizations, but of course we could not openly. Uh, at the time for fear of being uh, persecuted yes. or prosecuted. Yes. But that enlightened us and perhaps that answers what could possibly be your next question. The political environment in which I grew up mm. uh, enabled me to pursue law as a career. I said yes. to myself, look, is this the law, mm. right? Or is this the law of the land which forces me to live in a particular area, but a white person uh, to live in a, ba a better area. Yes. I saw myself playing a meaningful role one day, not just in understanding the law, mm -hmm. but in making that law work for everybody else, mm -hmm. not just for the privileged mm -hmm. South Africans, but for everybody else, mm -hmm. irrespective of class, race, color or creed. That's how really I got stimulated and I got excited and uh, that generated my interest in pursuing law as a career. And now, you know, as a judge president of the Western Cape, I understand one of the main objectives was to actually encounter the apartheid system, you know, to, you know, bring about some law that would cater for every race, whether black, white, colored, does not really matter. Yes. Do you feel that as the judge president, you know, presiding you know, at the highest office in the Western Cape, have you achieved that? Uh, there are challenges. There is no legal system which is perfect at the end of the day. But one strives very hard to ensure that at the end of the day, one preside over a legal system yes. which is fair, which is transparent, which recognizes the principles of equality. So it, it, there are challenges to do with transformation on the bench. There is absolutely no question about it. Mm -hmm. There is still a long way, even in the Western Cape. There's still a long way to go in terms of ensuring that the bench is properly representative with regard to race and gender, but most importantly, with regard to the mind and the mindset. We need to have judges who are not just mathematical symbols, but judges who are sensitive to the ideals that are laid down in our constitution. We need judges who are sensitive to the issues and the challenges that confront us as a nation, such as racism, such as inequality, as issues concerning poverty, landlessness, unequal distribution of wealth. These are all issues that any legal system cannot turn a blind eye to. Law is an excellent tool yes. for engineering a social change. Correct. Law must be used to benefit the people yeah. because it is an excellent tool for engineering social change. That's what I would like to see. The law is an excellent tool for engineering social change. Yeah. For that reason, a judge is not a mathematical symbol. Yeah. Our upbringing, our own upbringing and the values uh, that were uh, that we inherited from our parents, that we learned from our mothers, that we learned from our parents. Those are the values that inform us. Yeah. Because a judge is not a mathematical symbol. We are human beings. Yes. First and you know, foremost. These sounds like some very fundamental values and I understand that every judge needs to at least, you know, um, embrace such values in order for them to carry out their duties. Do you perhaps feel that we have a challenge in terms of having, you know, with, with the judges serving in the Western Cape, do you feel there might be, you know, some sort of, you know, lack in terms of principles and values that you uphold as the judge president? And maybe this might, might be, you know, 
viewed or seen as some sort of you know delay in terms of executing mm -hmm. your duties as a judge president of the high court yes. i don't think the problem is confined to the western cape yes judges remember we all have our past we come from a variety of backgrounds even though all of us are so we have embraced this constitution the new constitution but obviously our value systems where we come from informs us in terms of how we interpret the law and how we interpret the constitution we do not expect judges to think alike all of them but certainly you would expect judges to think uh, to have a common vision share the same values right because all of us are from a very bad past which was colored by apartheid colored by uh, racism and colored by defined also by inequality correct i think now that you have actually you know um identified the challenge that we might still have in terms of you know having presiding officers at the high court or be it magistrate who are not yet transformed to actually you know come to embrace these principles and values that drive this about social change because obviously the work that you do does have an impact in what happens in the society yes. now wh what do you think about the south african you know judiciary as a whole well the, uh, i'm part of the south african judiciary remember <laughs> uh, i think we uh, we obviously we, it's a learning curve we still all have a long way to go but the most important thing is that we must embrace the constitution as we go along we right. must make sure that yes. the the values and the principles that are enshrined in the constitution are in fact internalized yes i'm one person who has openly said for instance judgments particularly of the constitutional court must be short and straight okay. to the point. Exactly. I mean, why should I have a judgment which is 88 pages telling me why the death penalty <laughs> is outlawed <laughs> yes. instead of just a 10 page judgment, mm -hmm. which basically says the right to life is so important, you yeah. can't give it away. Mm -hmm. I don't want a judgment which is 88 pages. <laughs> they must be so short, written in simple language, so that even a taxi driver can, can understand. Yes. That would be just one way of ensuring that we internalize the Constitution uh, quicker rather, we, sooner rather than later. Yeah. Because for me it is important that all South Africans, mm -hmm. particularly those who fought for this constitution, mm -hmm. all South Africans must benefit from the constitution. Correct. We can't have a situation whereby people, the vast majority of South Africans, because they are poor, they have no access to land, they've got no access to the economic resources, mm -hmm. uh, they have no access to justice, they are marginalized, yet these are the the very people who fought for liberation. So. Right. So I think you've said quite a mouthful information, you know, stuff about, you know, how the judiciary in terms of, you know, um, the court judgments that are issued out there need to be actually approached in a manner in which people like, you know, for example, myself, I'm not really, I'm not legal expert. I know nothing about that. And yet you find that there's this, you know, 500 pages of a court judgment in order for people such as myself, what is it, what approach do you think should actually be followed in making sure that we actually have this accessible court ac outcomes and we get to understand what is actually said in those outcomes of the court? My approach has always been mm. keep your judgments. The judges should keep their judgments simple, yes. short, straight to the point. Do not decide issues that you are not called upon to decide and avoid as far as possible referring to foreign law. Okay. That's where I have a problem with, for instance, courts yes. that tend to go to other jurisdictions, for instance, Western world, yeah. to go and to try and find solutions which will apply to Africa. Yes. That seldom works if we need any solution, particularly in the context of the Constitution. I do not understand why there is always reference to German law, mm -hmm. Canadian law. Mm -hmm. We should look to South Africa for solutions. Correct because our problems are peculiar to us. I, I don't think we'll ever find solution in those jurisdictions. Well, I'm, I'm wondering, uh, you know, as the head of, you know, the judiciary in the Western Cape, what sort of steps are you taking in, you know, 
into addressing you know the very same concerns you're raising well normally we have had in the past some kind of judicial training one of the things that are done i've often done that myself okay. we helped judges aspirant judges get trained by SAJ, which is South African judicial education institution okay one of the things that are, is done is teach judges how to write judgments oh. i often do it myself in the western cape address lower court judicial officers magistrates mm -hmm regional magistrates, newly appointed judges. I think there's a great deal of improvement. Okay. One other complicating factor in judgments mm -hmm. is the use of Latin. I still don't understand why judges use Latin in their judgments. It's a dead language. It's not even lectured. I mean, it is not even a requirement for, for, for having a, a, a law degree. Yes. When I did my LLB in those days, you had to do Latin. It's no longer even a requirement. Yes. The vast majority of the young generation lawyers do not study Latin. Yes. Yet you still find judges using Latin in their judgments. Hmm. That adds to the problem. Th so that in my view, judgments must be simple, yes. address the issues, use simple English or any official language that is being used. Hmm. But obviously the language of record is English. Yes. Straight to the point. Mm -hmm. Simple English. Mm -hmm. So Keep you would simple. actually agree that there should be some form of decolonization taking of form the mind. in the judiciary? Undoubtedly decolonization of the mind. I think yes. we aspire, we want to look scholarly, we want to <laughs> look like uh, House yeah. of Lords judges, we want to look like judges of the Supreme Court of America. The circumstances are totally different. different because we are in Africa. The vast majority of our people mm. have no access to justice Correct. by complicating justice judgments making them unduly scholarly and long we are in fact denying the very people access to justice mm. because in order for an ordinary human being let's say a teacher yes. an, edu an average but educated human being yeah. you will never understand a judgment of a court without being assisted by a lawyer to understand Correct. something basic Yes, yes. Now, I, I think that's a beautiful response. I'm also of the view that, of course, there should be mm -hmm. some sort of transformation because we need to accommodate yes. the ordinary people in the street. Absolutely. Often you find that it's only, you know, academics, you know, scholarly people who mm -hmm. get to understand how the whole law system works. It now, be um, like I'm thinking, is there some sort of coordination between the national office, you know, um, the judge, uh, um, the CJ, Chief Justice Mokoi Mokoi, right. in terms of, you know, all these beautiful proposals on how to transform, you know, the law and make it accessible to the ordinary people in the street. Are you sort of having some sort of, you know, um, uh, conversations with the higher office in terms of how you can make this whole law system very accessible to the people? In terms of judgment writing, as I indicated earlier, such a, which is South African Judicial Education Institute, always give uh, lectures a year in and year out, almost yes. every year, there will be a lecture to aspirant judges or newly appointed judges. One of the series of lectures that is given is on judgment writing. Mm -hmm. That's easy to deal with. Now, some of the things, the challenges that we are talking about, making the law accessible to the people, making people understand, relate yes. to the law, that's what I call Africanizing the law. Yes. I have publicly said we must Africanize the law. Let me explain what I mean. Our law is very Eurocentric. Yeah. When we say South African law is common law, mm -hmm. the, that is the law which we have inherited, which is of Roman Dutch origin and English. It's a fusion. Mm -hmm. South African common law is a fusion of Roman Dutch law, which we inherited from the uh, when we were colonized by the Africaners, and okay. English law. Mm -hmm. It is therefore a fusion, right? Mm -hmm. Now it was. It's called common law. Yeah. I do not have a problem per se with common law, other than the fact that we must not lose sight of the fact that when that common law was developed, mm -hmm. you and I had no right to vote. 
Correct. So it is not common to us. Yes. We had no input whatsoever mm -hmm. in making and developing what is today called South African common law. Mm -hmm. So it's clearly not common to us. So when I say Africanize the law, I'm not saying take the legal system mm -hmm. and throw it away. You yes. are not going to throw the baby with the bad water. Correct. But you want to make that system of the law, mm -hmm. which you have inherited from your colonizers, mm -hmm. you want it relevant to the people that it is supposed to regulate. Law is an instrument for engineering social change. Yes. Law is about regulating human behavior. Correct. Right? So in in order for people to understand and identify with the legal system, mm -hmm. you must make it relevant to their day-to-day -day needs and aspirations. Mm -hmm. I'll give you a number of examples. It's high time that academics, for instance, when they write books, yeah. books yeah. they give examples that we can relate to. Let's take an example, company law. Yeah. Company law works on this basis. Say there is a company, the shareholders, people who have shares in the company, mm -hmm. get what is known as uh, they are shareholders, they have shares, and they get dividends at the end of the financial year. You can give a very good example that is close to your heart as an African. There is what we call in my culture, Ilimo, right? Ilimo, this is what happens. You, for instance, I live here. Uh, neighbors from the vicinity would come and assist when it's time to plow, right? They would come with their grain, they would come with, with whatever, they would come with their hose, we plow, we work together. That's a very good analogy of a company, but it has the following consequences. That food, those crops will not belong to me only. When it's time to reap, when it's time to harvest, I must share that with the rest of my community. Isn't that an outstanding example That's of a dividend? And the company is issuing out dividends. Why are academics, when they write scholarly books, not use such examples, things that we can relate to as the African people and as the majority in the country? We can multiply examples. All I'm trying to say when I say, let us Africanize the law. The law is too Eurocentric and the judges continue to refer in case after case to what I consider to be foreign law, which is basically European law, which strictly speaking should have no place in our legal system. We should be paying more and more attention to our needs so that our system can rapidly evolve in line with our constitution. Some beautiful insights right there. Um, I think everyone would be excited to actually, you know, get to hear you as the judge president of the Western Cape, having those beautiful thoughts on how we need to transform the judiciary and make it accessible to the people and also Africanize it, as you had said. Have to Africanize it. Right. So moving right along. Um, I'm interested, everyone else is interested in knowing because we have seen like, you know, um, from the media, we've read from the media, we've learned that, you know, um, there's some sort of, you know, um, cases going on at the JSC. But moving into that question, I need to ask, um, how is your relationship with the judge? I mean, like um, the CJ, the Chief Justice of, you know, uh, the Republic of South Africa, Mukhoeng Mukhoeng. I respect Chief Justice Mukhoeng Mukhoeng mm -hmm. as a judge as a human being and as a colleague. He is the head of the judiciary. He is therefore my boss. I respect him. And I thought there was mutual respect yes. until recent events. When I say recent events, uh, in January this year there was a complaint which was widely publicized against me, which was uh, lodged by Deputy Judge President Goliath. That was on the 15th of January, 2020. I responded to that complaint. I subsequently filed a counter complaint. The matter was heard by the JCC, the Judicial Conduct Commission, and uh, basically by a majority of two against one, dismissing the complaint by Goliath. Mm -hmm. Subsequent thereto, there were other events that took place. To cut the long story short, Chief Justice Mukhoeng, Mukhoeng intervened and wrote a judgment in terms of which he referred the complaint against me by Judge 
uh, Deputy Judge President Goliath to the Judicial Service Tribunal, right, which obviously would initiate the impeachment proceedings. Yeah. At the time of the ruling by the Chief Justice, I read it, his judgment, several times. It is very clear. Uh, the language that the Chief Justice used in his judgment. For instance, he makes reference to violence against women. The charge, one of the, there was no complaint by Deputy Judge President against me relating to any acts of violence directed to her. There was none. So these are some of the things that I began to question when I analyzed the judgment. But subsequent thereto, Chief Justice Mukhoeng Mukhoeng's issued a statement, a media statement. This was clearly in response to an inquiry by Daily Maverick. It transpired that on the 11th of October 2019, Judge Goliath had a scheduled secret meeting with the Chief Justice in Johannesburg. I did not know about that meeting to begin with. And the judicial conduct committee at the time when it had the complaint did not know about that. In other words, it was not disclosed to the Judicial Conduct Commission that the Chief Justice had a scheduled prior meeting with the complainant way back on the 11th of October 2019. The same Chief Justice who subsequently sat in a matter in respect of which he was privy to a wide range of allegations against me. The same Chief Justice sat in that matter and wrote a judgment, which I challenge you to read, was clearly one-sided. In terms of that judgment, he dismissed a valid complaint of racism against Patricia Goliath, my deputy, uh -huh. and the, the complaints against me were upheld and they were referred to the Judicial Conduct Tribunal. Mm -hmm. Two things that are important in this regard. There was a scheduled meeting. It was a secret meeting. I did not know about it. And this was way back on the 11th of October 2020. At that meeting, I don't know who was present, yes. but it is clear that the meeting was about me. Justice Mukhueng never told me anything. It took him seven months before he went public and said, indeed, there was a meeting. And the statement that he made was not a statement made under oath. In other words, he is yet to tell under oath exactly what was discussed at that meeting. Hmm. He has not taken the South African public into confidence under oath as to exactly what was discussed mm -hmm. at that meeting. It was a scheduled meeting. Judge Goliath was supposed to be sitting in court on a Friday. I had allocated work to her. She lied to a colleague that she was supposed to sit with and said she had a private business matter mm -hmm. to attend. Right. Meanwhile, she had a scheduled prior meeting with the Chief Justice. Are you aware that I have filed a complaint against Chief Justice Mukhuang? It is dated the 14th uh, of September 2020. Okay. Uh, it's a detailed complaint. It's a complaint of gross misconduct against the Chief Justice. Oh. Chief Justice Mukhuang instigated the complaint against me. He threw Patricia Goliath, mm. he encouraged Judge Parker to file a false complaint of assault against me. Judge Parker has gone public and denied that he was assaulted by me. Mm. But Justice Mukhueng instigated the complaint and asked Judge Goliath to tell Judge Parker that there was a scheduled meeting. Mm. And Parker said, I'm not interested and I'm not complaining. After the meeting, Goliath returned to Judge Parker and said, I've been with the Chief Justice. He is waiting for the complaint. This is the number of Mr. Slingers. Mr. Slingers is the PA of the Chief Justice. Again, Judge Parker declined and said, I am not complaining. I have no problems with Judge Lop. 
right? So you have a chief justice who is sitting on the bench, yes. who instigates a complaint against a fellow judge. He is involved in the investigation of that complaint. He prosecutes that complaint. He waits for it. When it comes, he takes it back from the JCC, Judicial Conduct Tribunal. He writes a ruling. That's unheard of. That is unheard of. It's not done. So he, he played the role of an instigator, an investigator, a policeman, or a policeman because he did the investigation. Mm -hmm. He prosecuted and he sat in his own course. Mm -hmm. And quite frankly, the truth is yet to be told as to what transpired at that private scheduled meeting. Mm -hmm. The Chief Justice is yet to go on oath and tell the South African public under oath what was discussed at that meeting and why did he sit and instigate a complaint against me. The reason why nobody is talking about that complaint is because everybody is aware of the complaint yeah. and it is being swept under the carpet. The reason why everybody sees me as a naughty boy of the judiciary is because that's all the public is told every day. You will never believe anything if you are not told about it. There are so many judges, for instance, in this country that there are complaints pending against them, including Chief Justice Mukwege himself. Mm. The complaint has not even been acknowledged. Nobody is talking about it. It is being swept under the carpet, and I'm not going to allow that. You asked me about the complaints that are pending before the Judicial Correct. Service Commission. I mentioned, I started from the, the late, the recent, the most recent one, uh, the one that was filed by Judge Goliath yes. on the 15th of January this year, right? Uh, the complaint which has been outstanding now for some 13 years was first brought against me by the judges of the Constitutional Court way back in 2008. Yes. The complaint was that I tried improperly to influence them to rule in favor of the former president of this country, Mr. Jacob Zuma. Correct. The two judges that I allegedly spoke to were judges Gabinda and Jafta. To date, they have not filed a complaint. Mm. Instead, judges that I did not even speak to are complaining. Mm -hmm. Right. That again, so when I saw this new complaint by uh, Patricia Goliath that I assaulted no, Judge Parker, yes. it is a mirror image of the old complaint of 2008, whereby the persons or judges that I allegedly spoke to mm. are not complaining, but their colleagues, some of them were not even in the building, are the ones who are complaining. It's exactly the same thing here. Judge Parker is not complaining. He has not laid any criminal charges against me. He is on record as having said he was not assaulted by me. We resolved whatever differences we had. Yet there are judges in the division, Patricia Goliath, yes. ably as assisted by Chief Justice Mukweng. They are complaining against me. Meanwhile, the person who was allegedly assaulted by me is not complaining. Mm -hmm. So this complaint is a mirror image of the old complaint in 2008, mm -hmm. right? Perhaps you want to ask me, why do I think? Yeah, in fact, I was coming to that. <laughs> yes. In 2000, and before 2004, I was a darling of the legal profession. Everybody loved me. And why was I was that? scholarly, yeah. writing beautiful judgments. You can still read them. Yes. Right. I was loved by everybody. Mm -hmm. So many people, in fact, including the late Chief Justice Charles Carlson. Yes. I was, I was even tipped to be Chief Justice. Yes. So many people said that, including the late Chief Justice Charles Kalsi, including the present Chief Justice Mukhueng Mukhueng. Mm -hmm. He said to me at least on two occasions that he knew that I was tipped to be Chief Justice before him. He knows that. So I was a darling of the profession. 
The turning point was in 2004. What happened? In 2004, I authored a report on racism based on my experience. Yes. Remember, I was appointed as a judge in 1995. So it took me time to experience different things and to look around, share the common experiences with fellow black judges, look at what is happening in the profession. I decided to address it because at that time I was already judged. President. I was appointed as Judge President on the 1st of May, year 2000. Yes. So I'm the Judge President now. I said, look, I'm not prepared to continue to preside over this racism. I filed a report, detailed various instances of racism uh, that I experienced as a judge and the other fellow judges and members of the profession, black mm. people were experiencing. Yes. I'll give you one example. What they would do, for instance, I allocate a case to a black judge, it's urgent, they don't like it, suddenly they find a way, they say, no, we've settled, we've gone to postpone it. Mm -hmm. How do you postpone the hearing of a matter which is urgent? Yes. But if I similarly allocate an agent matter to a white colleague, they rush to court, they get the results. There were a number of instances which are detailed in my report, the racism report, and I mentioned big names in that report. Yeah. And to this very date, I never had peace after the racism report of year 2004. There were attempts even to sue me, there were attempts to insult me, yeah. year in and year out. It all started in 2004 with the racism report. Yeah. Remember in 2008, the racism report had already been filed at least two, uh, four years prior to that. Yeah. So it all started in the year 2004. Prior to that, I was adored, I was revered, I was a darling of the profession. I used to do so much. I was used, I would train judges, I would be called to investigate this, train aspirant judges, all of that is a thing of the past. I am now publicly insulted and nullified and treated uh, uh, like a corrupt person or an illegitimate child of the family. It all started when I told the truth about the legal profession. And one of the things that I raised was skewed briefing patterns. Yeah. We live in a country where the economy is still in the hands of very few South Africans, and it's largely white South Africans, and that is a fact. So I also said in my racism report, Lawyers of today, attorneys and advocates, are judges of tomorrow. So if the briefing patterns are skewed, inevitably white lawyers get better training because they get good quality work from good quality law firms. Those good quality law firms get that work from white clients. So if you have skewed briefing patterns, inevitably black lawyers are relegated, right? They are of secondary importance. A white person is enabled, he gets training, he is exposed, he gets work from fellow white people. Right. They are in control of the economy. They are in control as to who should be given work. Yeah. So I argued in my racism report that the profession must do something about that. One of the things that the profession could do, it is simply, for instance, insist that whenever a black person, sorry, whenever a senior black white lawyer appears, he or she must be accompanied by a junior black. There are various ways of ensuring that uh, the briefing patterns uh, are level, that they are not skewed, yes. because lawyers of today are judges of tomorrow. Correct. Of course, I was, uh, I was insulted. There were people who denied that there is racism in the profession. Some even said Chope is mad, Chope is unstable. Alas, unless if you want me to believe that there is racism in South Africa, but somehow the legal profession is insulated, Please go and tell that to the birds. You can't have a legal profession which is insulated yes. in circumstances where there is racism throughout the Republic of South Africa. The legal profession is no different. It's high time that we talk about it. When I raise it, I was insulted. I am still paying the price even today.
So in terms of, you know, the racism report you filed yes. back then, you make mention that there were people who wanted to sue you for the mm. report, people were not happy mm. with the report, and you also allege that there are, you know, even if I understand very correctly, you know, fellow judges were actually denied that there is, you know, some yes. patterns of racism in yes. the judiciary. Yes, uh, I was subjected to all kinds of pressure. There were certain judges that I mentioned in the report, some are dead and some are still alive, and there were certain prominent advocates. Some of them have uh, uh, passed on and some yes. are still alive. Various attempts were made to suppress the racism Court. I even remember the late Chief Justice Langa yes. was asked by the late Chief Justice Charles Carlson mm -hmm. to come to the Western Cape and talk to me, mm -hmm. try to persuade me to withdraw the racism report, and okay. I, did, I refused. Okay. I communicated that to Chief Justice Langa, I refused to withdraw it. So there were various attempts that were made to bring about pressure to bear upon me mm -hmm. to withdraw the racism report. I refused to withdraw it because those allegations stand. They are as valid as they were in 2004. Mm -hmm. We can test them very quickly. Have the briefing patterns changed, particularly in the Western Cape? The answer is no. That explains why every year you get new, uh, we admit young black women and men, but they don't stay because there is no work for them. They are in and out in the profession, right? Mm -hmm. Has racism in South Africa as a whole, uh, has it disappeared suddenly? Has it faded? It is still alive. Mm -hmm. So I still ask myself, why am I being persecuted for telling the truth? Mm -hmm. that there is racism in the profession. And now, Judge President, why would the then, you know, um, Chief Justice try to persuade you to withdraw the report? Well, and because now I'm thinking to myself, if you had come up with such a beautiful report, you know, um, airing your views out there, giving people the insights of what is happening in the judiciary, you obviously, you know, are steering um, this transformation which we all desire to have in the country. And yet you've got fellow judges who are saying that you must be suppressed. In fact, you must remove the report. Why is that? Well, I can only speculate. Part of the reason could be that I mentioned names, big names in the report, people who were carrying themselves out as liberal. But I came up with evidence that yes. proved that they were not as liberal as they were, right? Uh, that's part of the reason. But I also think the report was ahead of its time. I think at the time, uh, people did not want to talk about racism, right? It was in 2004 for one reason or the other. Uh, but now we are beginning to see a ground swell. A lot of uh, South Africans are experiencing racism Correct. and they are talking more and more uh, about it. They are outspoken about it, whereas in the past, uh, I think people did not want to talk about it. It's something that people just did not want to talk about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I... <laughs> it is still a hot potato. You talk about it, you suffer the consequences. You, you, you indeed suffer the consequences. Yes. Now, you've made mention of the former president, Jacob Zuma. Yes. What is your relationship with the president? And maybe the follow-up question would be, have you been to Ghana? No, I've never been to Nkandla. I, I first met President Jacob Zuma in Stenga. I normally attend Mkito uh, Gashaga on the 24th of September. I think that was the first time I met President Jacob Zuma there. But also my son Tutuga. I have a son, my firstborn Tutuga, is, uh, is a friend to Zuma's daughter right, who in turn was married to uh, Umay Shlome Chwete, okay. the son to the late Steve Chwete. Steve Chwete yes. And uh, obviously when he was the president, there were occasions that I went to Denier's, for instance, to swear in mm -hmm. an acting uh, minister. Mm -hmm. For instance, Minister Bongo, right, mm -hmm. Bongani Bongo was I administered the oath of office to him mm -hmm. when he became the minister. So you have not allocated 
cases, you know, concerning Jacob Zuma to, 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 to judges that might be very close to you influencing the outcome of the court. Right. Knowing President Zuma is one thing. We are not friends. Yes. For instance, let us take uh, Upana Pastul. He is my lawyer. Yes. But I think it's fair to say he is more than my lawyer. He is a brother. He is a friend. Yes. I'll be very uncomfortable. I can't sit in a matter involving Upana Pastor. Mm -hmm. President Zuma is not the only head of state that I have met in my life. I also met Mandela way back in 1994. He wanted to buy my house in Transkai, a Fort Gale. Mm -hmm. He came there, he met me in 1996 when I was here in Cape Town as a judge. He remembered that very distinctly. Yes. So President Zuma is not the only president that I knew and that I have met. Again, President Thabo mm -hmm. I met the president because I had occasion, at least two or three occasions, to go to parliament upon being invited by the president to go and administer the oath of office to a minister or an acting minister. So President Jacob Zuma is not the only head of state that I have met in this country. But I'm not saying he is definitely not my friend. So he would not receive favors from you? Definitely he won't receive favors. He would never receive any favors from me. Okay, and with the sitting current president, Ramaphosa, have you met him? I have met President Ramaphosa at least on three occasions. Okay. The first time, if I remember well, when I met him, it was way back when he was still active in the struggle. In the 80s, I think he was with, uh, I will tell you, NUM. Okay. Right, way back. That I don't even think he would remember that. The second time when I met the president, we were at in Pretoria at the residence of the president Jacob Zuma. There was a meeting that President Jacob Zuma convened with the judiciary. Mm -hmm. I was part of that judiciary. I remember at that meeting even the former deputy president, the Hang Mosinege, was there. Yes. So it was a meeting convened between the politicians led by President uh, Jacob Zuma and the judiciary. We were led by our own chief justice. He was definitely there. He do you, remembers. Do you sort of want to give us details of the meeting that was convened? by the then president? The, I think the meeting dealt in Ta'alia with some of the tension and expectations and challenges that the judiciary had vis-a-vis -vis the executive. Yes. But it was a widely publicized meeting. I went there in my capacity as a head of court. It was not a scheduled secret meeting like the meeting between Goliath and Mohueng. No. <laughs> This is an exclusive interview with the Judge President Shope of the Western Cape. Um, judge President, your wife, Judge Sally Shope, is a member of the judiciary in the Western Cape. Yes, that is so. She's and, a judge. And you are responsible, you know, as the head of the judiciary in the province to allocate cases. That's right. And some people would actually say it as a conflict of interest. And I understand that there's been complaints that you sort of, you know, allocate some cases for her. Right. How true she is, is that? Is it true she is one of the judges in the Western Cape? She reports to me like all judges. I also allocate work to her like all other judges. We are married and we don't sit together precisely to avoid a situation whereby people, would, the litigants, would say there was some kind of pillow planning. But let me ask you this question. Are you not better off with colleagues or judges who are married and who are open about it as opposed to judges who are in love but do not disclose that to the parties. There are judges who are in love, judges are human beings. There are judges who are in love and there are also members of the profession, attorneys and advocates who are in love. There is nothing wrong with being in love and also there is nothing wrong with being married. There is no suggestion Judge Sally Shop has been a judge in that division for seven years now. This is her eighth year. There have never been any complaints of any nature relating to the performance of her functions or complaints relating to the fact that she is favored by me in terms of the allocation of work. That complaint first surfaced in January this year when it was made by Judge Goliath. Okay. 
it must be remembered that the Chief Justice himself, when we got married in, in April 2015, he was present at our marriage, he endorsed our marriage, he saw absolutely nothing wrong with our marriage. Talking about the Chief Justice, if you remember, he was also interviewed. When he was interviewed, they put it to him that his wife had appeared before him. <laughs> they made it an issue, and he dealt with that on the basis that he's a professional person, there was nothing wrong. But I can assure you, I avoid sitting with my wife on the bench because the litigants are entitled to have a fair process, to be heard fairly, and there must be no perceptions of impropriety. She does not get favored by me in any event. I allocate work fairly, openly, and transparently. She is not favored at all. And it happens in other professions. It happens in the teaching profession. It happens uh, in the medical profession. After all, we are human beings. Right. Uh, welcome back, Judge President Lopez of the West. Thank you very much. This is part two of our interview. And once again, thank you very much for availing yourself. Thank you very much, Mr. Makwaka. I appreciate that. All right. Thank you. Okay, so moving right along, um, you know, just to get at least your understanding of, you know, the political landscape in the country, what do you make of everything that is happening currently? Well, we are a young democracy, about 26 years old, to be precise. There are so many challenges that we have uh, stemming from uh, the colonial colonialism and apartheid and conquest and uh, dispossession of land in particular and the poverty in which we find ourselves. This has given rise to the kind of corruption that you find today. This has given rise to greed. People want uh, to have money, they are greedy. And it is said because we are busy exploiting our resources and uh, this is the kind of money that should be well spent to build infrastructure, to, uh, to improve on our system of education and most importantly to deal with health issues and other related issues confronting us as a nation. But money is sadly being squandered left, right and centre. So corruption must be rooted out in, in all forms, whether in terms of stealing or in terms of nepotism or in any form, manner or shape. It must be, uh, it should not, it must be stamped out, it must be rooted out. Now putting yourself in my shoes as right. an ordinary citizen of That's this right. country, do you see some sort of high profile, you know, individuals being arrested, being held to account yes. by the law, I mean, enforcement agencies in the country? There is no reason why high profile individuals should not be brought to book. The law must be applied evenly, irrespective of who you are, irrespective of your political affiliation, irrespective of your contribution uh, to South Africa today, or irrespective of who you are and your social standing. If you have committed a crime, you must be dealt with accordingly. Now, there's been an, you know, an outcry from the public that high-profile politicians me. or yes. business people don't often you know, get to actually account. And we say this because there's been allegations leveled against so many people, you know, in, in government, and yet they're not getting arrested, you know. Speaking of corruption, there's the Zondo Commission sitting right now, and we are yet to see the fruits of that That's commission. Right. What are your views about that? Uh, there are high profile, indeed there have been instances where high profile people have been prosecuted. I mean a very good example is, is uh, we spoke, you made reference earlier to former President Zuma. He has been prosecuted and there are many other, other examples. Obviously one would expect the law enforcement agencies, the prosecutors, to prosecute a winnable case irrespective of who the suspect is, irrespective of who the accused is. I'm not in a position to say why is so-and-so not prosecuted, why is so-and-so only prosecuted. It is for the prosecuting authorities to apply the law even-handedly. That is their duty. 
you asked me about the Zondo Commission. I do not have problems with the Commission per se. It is one of the mechanisms or one of the instruments uh, that are in place to deal with aspects of corruption that we spoke about. Yes. Uh, I welcome it as a Commission. Uh, like so many other commissions of inquiry that we have had, I welcome them. Uh, it is of concern, obviously, that it is taking longer to, to, uh, before it is finalized, because every day one is anxious as to when this commission will wrap up its activities. We have not seen much, it is true, in terms of prosecutions. Uh, in terms of those who have been implicated in the Zondo Commission. It is obviously not for me as a judge to say so and so must be prosecuted. I think the prosecuting authorities, and I hope the prosecuting authorities are busy preparing dockets in respect of those individuals who may have been mentioned, but it is not for me to prescribe to them who should be prosecuted and when. But I do hope that those who have been implicated, if there is evidence against them, I would expect the law enforcement officers to prepare dockets and they must be brought to book like any other South African who has committed a crime, he or she must face the consequences. I think this brings us to the question, the state of capture, you know, um, the terms of reference in terms of the Zonda Commission, we can see the direction it's taking. You know, um, all these Gupta linked individuals are being investigated from the previous administration of Jacob Zuma. Would, would you not be interested in at least having, you know, some members of the judiciary also, you know, being brought to book? Because there has been allegations that, you know, with the CR17 yes. yes. uh, um, campaign funds, there are members of the judiciary who might have received some funds from the current sitting president. Are you not interested in having, you know, um, um, the terms of reference extended to also accommodate the judiciary so that we see um, um, what actually happened there? Because yes. right now the country needs to know what is actually going on with the judiciary. Well, that's an interesting question. Obviously, it is not for me as a sitting judge to make recommendations for the terms of the commission to be extended. But I think where there is evidence that members of the judiciary have been involved in any allegations of corruption, there is no reason why that should not be investigated. I get investigated, I get reported to the JSC, left, right and center. There is no reason in my view why any high-profile member of the judiciary should not be investigated. And uh, nothing should be swept under the carpet. So I would welcome any kind of an investigation. And if the terms were to be broadened to cover the judiciary, provided there are serious allegations relating to certain judicial officers, I would welcome that intervention. And I would hope that the sooner that is done, the better so that the activities of the Zondo Commission are finalized. And I'm sure Judge Zondo himself would want to go back to the bench now and preside in the constitutional law uh, where he is most needed as a judge. Now, doesn't it concern you that there are allegations that you know some members of the judiciary have actually received something from these documents, from these sealed yes. documents? with regards to the CR-17 uh, campaign? I can assure you I'm not one of them. Had I been <laughs> one of them, the whole world would have known by now. I'm definitely not one of them. I have not received any bribe from anyone. It is obviously a matter of concern that there are some members of the judiciary. There are rumors to that effect. But I think a rumor remains a rumor. Uh, but where it is a credible rumor, I would expect it to be followed through to be thoroughly investigated and acted upon. But as a judge myself, it is always a matter of concern that there are rumors against one of us or some of us. But as I say, if there are serious rumors, they must be pursued, they must be followed and be investigated properly. And those judges who are affected must be brought to book. Corruption in any form should not be tolerated. We have limited resources. As I said, the resources that we have will be well spent on other things rather than money going to the pockets of greedy individuals.